Why are there so few female magicians? It's a great question. In this next episode on the Creed podcast, we uncover the remarkable story of someone who has walked an extraordinary and unconventional path. What should we expect from Caroline Raven in the future? Greatness. Caroline Raven transitioned from theology school and preaching to becoming one of the world's foremost female magicians. Early in her career, Caroline mesmerized audiences by winning awards in the Swedish and Nordic Magic Championships. She was named Inspirational Person of the Year and received the prestigious Truxer Award for her spellbinding achievements both nationally and internationally. Caroline has cast her spell at TEDx events on five separate occasions and is a regular headliner on luxury cruise ships worldwide. Her show, a delightful blend of humor and magic, has taken her from the charming town of Höganäs in the south of Sweden to the dazzling stages of Las Vegas, the mecca of magicians. I got a lot of questions for you. Okay, exciting. So, so this has been six months in the making. Yeah. First off, safe place, be yourself. I want to talk about your life, your career in magic. And I'm going to call you, look, I know what it's like just a little bit. I don't know necessarily entirely what it's like, but you are a magician. I'm That's not going to call you a female magician. Oh. <laughs> when, I, when I was in school, people used to call me black magician. I'm like, it sounds like witchcraft. Really? <laughs> yeah. I'm a magician. And yeah. so I want to talk about your father, your grandfather, the impact they had on your life. I want to talk about your journey from theology school to becoming a magician and your book, Caroline Raven, the business side of show business, how to make a living doing magic. And I've read more than half of it. And I'm so glad that I read it. I'm almost done. I was trying to finish it before this meeting, but as I was going through it, I'm like, there's a lot of principles in here that I really need because, mm -hmm. you know, I do mentalism and it's something that I've always wanted to do as a career, but I just was like, you know, I'm just going to put it to the side, maybe some point in the future, who knows? Mm -hmm. And as I've gone through it, this book is really good for anybody who's in the entertainment energy industry, not just, you know, doing magic and a lot of good principles in there. How you doing, Caroline? I am good. Thank you. How are you doing? Doing absolutely amazing. It's very early uh, for you, no? Say it again? It's very early for you today, huh? Uh, a little bit. I, I, I don't like to sleep. Uh, what? I, I like to sleep. stay up late and wake up early. <laughs> what? We have nothing in common. How did this interview come about, Caroline? I think I posted something and you said, oh my God, that's crazy. You're a witchcraft something. And I said, we can talk about this in your podcast. <laughs> and that was like six months ago. <laughs> it was. So yeah, Caroline did a magic trick. She made a cookie disappear. And I oh, accused her of what? something. I accused <laughs> her of doing witchcraft. And, and you know what? As I was going through your book, I found proof of what I, my statement. You said in your book, you said, it's been a heck of a journey from theology school and preaching to selling my soul to Satan for card tricks. See? Yep. It's proof. <laughs> I say it in every show too. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great line. I really love saying it. And yeah. it ends with me saying, and here we are now, want some more? And then we continue on with the next trick. Right. <laughs> um, and, and it's such a great line. And you know, yesterday I went to church because my, my niece was um, getting baptized and the priest was talking to me a little bit because I was going to read some. Uh, and he was like, I'm not sure if you're familiar of how to read this. And I had to inform him, I've studied theology for five and a half years. And then he goes, oh, wait, so you're that girl who turned magician. That's crazy. We have to talk about this afterwards. And we did. He ended up booking me for a show. So that was fantastic. Uh, but during the baptism, I was sitting there like I was sitting there. I was like, maybe, maybe this is what the calling is. Like I used to sit in a church and feel like I was called to be a preacher or to be somebody like a leading position in the church. And then as I was sitting there, of course, I could feel the calling still of, you know, being inspirational and all of that stuff. But for a second, I was like, 
maybe the calling has always been to magic because I've always wanted to interact with people in such a way where where it's like all about them and not about me. So if right. you see a great magic show, I feel like the best magic tricks and magic performances are when everything is like surrounded about you. Like, what are you thinking about? Or why is this your card? Why does this matter to you? Um, right. And I felt that calling in the church again. And it was, it was beautiful because I haven't felt that anywhere else um, except for on a stage in a really long time. So that was a very Amazing. nice reminder. Wow. That see that really intrigues me because when I was growing up, um, I wasn't really Christian. I you know kind of was a little bit, and I got into doing magic. And when I got into doing magic, people started telling me I was doing witchcraft and you need to repent and hardcore Bible thumping type of church. So when when I heard that you used to preach and then you transitioned from preaching to doing magic. What was people's response like to that? Wow, uh, all sorts. Uh, but from the people that were working in the church with me, they were, uh, first they weren't super surprised. They were more like, oh, okay, interesting. Uh, you're <laughs> welcome back at any time. When this doesn't work out for you, you're welcome back. Uh, but they ended up booking my first shows. Like I was doing my very first shows in the church or for people who are part of the church so that was a very easy way for me to um to like use the network that i had already built and use the uh, credibility and authority in a way for people who already knew me even though they didn't know me in the in the profession of a magician they knew me as somebody who would stand on a stage and deliver a speech amazing wow so i want to go sometimes when i interview people i have a hard time trying to figure out where to start I found a great place to start. Amazing. Let's go to the beginning of your life. In the beginning. Caroline Ra Raven. <laughs> <laughs> your grandfather did a illusion for you. He pulled a coin from behind your ear. And, and I like that story because when I was probably around five or six years old, I went on a vacation with my grandfather and a girl he was dating at the time to California. And the first time I ever seen a magic trick, a, a magician pulled a coin from behind my ear and, or I saw them do it to someone else. I don't remember, but I remember it just total. It just blew my mind. I was messed up. I was traumatized by magic. Tell me about <laughs> what that was yeah. like for you. And that, that kicked off your journey. Um, in, in full transparency, I don't remember the first feeling of magic because it was okay. always there. Um, because of my, you know, public speeches and doing TEDx talks, you have to create a story um, that touches people's hearts, right? Uh, and the story is basically, I remember a feeling of warm tears filling my eyes as I thought that one day I'm going to be just like him, uh, referring to that first ever time he pulled a coin from behind my ear. But I've heard stories about him, you know, finding everything behind my ears. Like I would lose <laughs> my... Uh, like my teddy bear or whatever, I would be scratching my neck trying to find it because it was always there because grandpa always pulled things from my ear. Uh, but as I grew older and, and also turning this into a profession, my siblings and my cousins have all said the same thing. Like grandpa never did any magic for us. And I was like, what are you saying? Like <laughs> you're talking so much BS right now. It's not even funny. Uh, but apparently he only performed magic with me or to me. Um, so that made our bond very, very special. I even keep his hat in my office actually at all times. So I have his magic hat back here. That um, is cool. Yeah, it's very nice. It's a, now it's a prop. Uh, yeah. Cause I have uh, like nails inside. Don't tell anyone, but <laughs> it's prepared for a magic <laughs> trick. Uh, so he's always with me, you know? Yeah. Was he, <laughs> did he like per perform professionally or? No, no, he didn't. Okay. Um, he, well, he did parties and stuff, but he wasn't like a, yeah, or just anything. for you. Yeah, he did. Yeah, for me, it was a very, very special thing for me. Um, I don't remember much because he passed away when I was very young. I was like eight years old. Yeah. So I don't remember like 
that much. But it's kind of the same thing when you go to a restaurant, you don't really remember the food or whatever it was on the menu. You remember the people you were there with and right. the people around you, the atmosphere. And it's the same thing with this. Like I remember, I remember all about the atmosphere. I remember his house. I remember the smell. I remember that he only spoke Danish. And even though I'm from the south of Sweden, I didn't understand much of what he said. So, uh, and as also my dad told me a few years ago, my grandpa always asked me to to pick up milk from the store and he wanted the one that had the the white lid and not the red one and i always got <laughs> the red one because right. i didn't understand uh and it makes sense now like i remember his like face of disappointment when i came back with the milk every time um yeah i didn't understand and i didn't know and he never really corrected me so i guess he had to live with it yeah. for a while <laughs> amazing so correct me if i'm wrong your your father also passed away too right he did yeah recently yeah recent okay yeah well, that's why we had to push the interview unfortunately he passed away in in april wow well i hope you're doing well with that i mean that's a tough one right there so yeah you know it's uh i've been getting some stiff necks and uh some some like um just a word for that like uh um you, you know like uh waves of grief in a way yeah, uh, yeah. kind of just hits you weird sometimes and i mentioned before that i was in church yesterday and that was the same church that we buried him in so that was very you know emotional yeah. still coming back to that church for the first time since that big event um and i mean life will never be the same again i don't know if if people who are listening to this have lost a sibling or a parent or even a grandparent that's to them close um, life is never the same. Of course, life will still be great, and you know everything continues. The show must go on, and all of yeah. these, all of these sayings. But it's uh, I don't think life will ever be the same. Uh, I always thought of my dad as my MacGyver. Do you remember that TV show? I, no, I've never heard of that. <laughs> oh my God, you have to look this up. Uh, so <laughs> MacGyver, he had this. Um, he was like a superhero in a way. So he had all of these good ideas of how to find things. Like he solved clues. Uh, and mysteries like in every show. So I remember one time I, I got a car from my dad, like a shitty car, like a really terrible car uh, that had a hole in the side of the, like this, what is that called? Like the, the gear thing, there was a hole in the side. Okay, and one right. time I had only the key, like the car key and I, I dropped it and it fell down into the hole in the car. And I was like, what do I do now? Oh man. Like, this, is, this is terrible. So I call my dad, tell him what happened. And he was like, okay, you need two things to fix the situation. <laughs> Do you have a pen? And I said, yes. Do you have gum? And I was like, not sure where this is going, but yes. So he told me to chew on the gum and put it at the, at the tip of the pen, wait for a second, go down into the hole, stick it to the key, <laughs> and then pull it up. It worked. Genius. Genius. He just came up with that on the spot. Just... Yeah. yeah. So who <laughs> am I going to call now when I lose you know, all my stuff? Yeah. So right. I just have to carry a pen and gum with me at all times and I'll be fine. Wow. Well, I'm glad that you shared that. That's <laughs> wow. I I honestly I don't even know how to respond to that because I haven't had that happen with me yet, but you know, cause my, my, my grandfather's still alive and um, you know, he had some stuff happen where we thought he was gonna pass away, but I like how you're handling it though. Yeah. But he wouldn't want it to be any other way. Yeah. You know? One of the last things he ever said to me was, when are you going back on stage? Because he knew that I was canceling shows because I was with him for the, the last two weeks of his life. Uh, so he was like, so when are you going back out there? And I was like, I don't know, maybe Monday, maybe yeah. Wednesday, maybe week after. Because I didn't have a good answer because we didn't know that he was going to die. Because uh, my dad suffered from ALS. And yeah. he only had the diagnosis for about 13 months before he passed away. And how does and, that work? Uh, so ALS is a muscular disease. So you um, so you will lose part of your muscles like moving forward in your life. So it will, usually we'll start with you losing a hand or a leg or something like that. You will start to feel weaker and weaker in your body. Um, and after a while, you won't be able to walk anymore and talk anymore or eat anymore. Um, but so for him, it, he was fine up until um, up until Christmas, really. He went into the hospital for something like uh, he had a little bit of trouble breathing. 
Uh, so we went into the hospital over Christmas and New Year's, but he was fine until the end of January. And then at the end of January, he needed some sort of assistance in his house. So from eight till three, I think every day he had assistance in his house to help him with like, you know, cooking and cleaning and making sure he got, you know, everything that he needed throughout the day. And then two months later, uh, it was the first of April. They called me. I was down there. I live seven hours away. So I was down there for Easter mm -hmm. and uh, they called me and he said, they said, uh, your dad is in a lot of pain. So we're going to have to bring him to the hospital. But I think you should you should come with us. Um, and so I, you know, dropped everything and I went to see him and uh, uh, we kind of understood that the situation for him to stay at home wasn't, you know, bearable for people anymore. Like he he had been in pain throughout the nights and he didn't really have anybody to call because he was kind of losing his speech and right. uh, uh, he couldn't sit up by himself anymore. So everything was just going down very, very quickly for him. So we went into the hospital. Uh, or, well, we thought we were going to a hospital. We ended up going to palliative care. Is that how you say it? Um, and I didn't understand what, and I didn't know mm. what that was. I didn't know yeah. what hospice was. I mean, I had no idea what was happening, nor did he. So we ended up in this hospice place, which was a beautiful place of only 10 beds, loads of nurses and doctors, um, like literally beautiful place. Um, and then he was there for, like he, we got in there the Monday and then on the Tuesday, I decided to go back to Stockholm because, you know, I have two kids and I have a career that I have to take care of. So I decided to go back home uh, here to record some stuff that I needed for a course that I released a couple of months ago. Mm. Um, so I came home for a day and a half and then flew back down there. So on the Thursday, um, so from Monday to th Thursday, really, they had gone from planning how he can have a more sustainable life at home to now we have to plan for him dying. So it was like two right. and a half days. It was crazy. So I just got there and uh, within hours after me coming, he lost his speech. Like he did not know how to speak anymore. So we were able to communicate that day and then, you know, it just kept going down. And we right. tried everything. We tried him. Uh, like the last thing he communicated and the very last thing was uh dracula like he wanted me to, to he wanted me to know that he was thinking about dracula because we me and my siblings were there we were making some jokes um and i don't remember what the joke was but he just really wanted me to know it was dracula so he br brought up this like big piece of paper that he could try to like point to the different uh letters as i had to spell it for him and i was like i don't understand that what is a d r a what do you mean oh, well, the like, vampire <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and he was a funny man. You would have loved him. He was an absolutely amazing man. Sounds um, like it. Yeah, definitely taken too early. He was only 63 when he passed away. So wow, very sad indeed. Well, I know you said that he he's helped you a lot, and especially in the beginning of your career. Mm. And so, I mean, we can go down that trail right there. Or how how did he help you throughout your career? Because one thing is, is especially with magic, I, may, maybe, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it has to do with just magic or maybe people don't see it as a career. But I remember when I got started doing mentalism, you know, a lot of people were impressed by me. And yeah, my grandfather, he absolutely loved it. If I tried to do other things in life or go to college or different things, he's like, okay, you can go to college. If I try to do any other type of venture business venture he'd just be like ah, no nah. i remember one day he just said to me i missed when you used to do magic and i was like he actually liked that and but other people though you tell them you want to do be a magician and they just they don't take it seriously and especially family i'm, I'm glad that i had a grandfather who supported me on that but i want to know how was that in your family when you decided to go down this path? Mm -hmm. uh, well, first, my dad wasn't super excited. Uh, oh, really? He, okay. Yeah, no, because I mean, he had seen the hobbyist magician from his dad. And you okay. know, that wasn't the life <laughs> <laughs> that he wanted for, uh, for one of his daughters. Uh, so my dad had five kids, right? Or six, actually, I, I lost my twin. So we were six. Uh, but now we're five and uh and i was the middle one of all of the ones that made it still so right um 
well, the last of the girls also, I guess. So for him, uh, he always wanted me to do more, I guess. Every every time I said I wanted to do something, he was like, yeah, what about you do that? And you add this. Like, okay, um, right. I was really good at Spanish. So I still speak Spanish a little bit at home to teach the kids and stuff. Nice. Um, but uh, when I said that I wanted to study Spanish in school, he was like, okay, yeah, yeah. What about Russian? What about Latin, maybe? And we, you know, he wanted me to be some sort of um, European Union interpreter or something. Uh, that was never what I wanted to do, though. But right. every time I had this idea, he was like, yeah, let's add, let's add things. Um, but when I started doing magic professionally, he was like, okay, um, this is going to be fun. How much money do you have saved up? Um, <laughs> how, what's your plan for this? Um, so he ended up actually supporting me financially for a, a really long time, like a year and a half. I hope my siblings are not listening to this. I uh, also <laughs> added this into the book, uh, like the dedication to my yeah. dad. Um, he would drive me to places I never knew existed. He would sit in a car waiting. He would blow up balloons with me because for a while I thought I was going to do balloon sculpting animal stuff shows. Yeah. Uh, so he would sit with me in these ice cold gymnasiums filling up 1500 balloons you know bleeding fingers just to make sure it worked you know right um yeah and he was uh, very supportive and very nice to me and you know every time like every day he would call me around six and be like okay it's 90 minutes from now there's going to be dinner so i'm just about to start this do you want this or not and I, you know, <laughs> right. I got picky i got picky after a while i was like okay so what are you doing today <laughs> like checking the menu first but um I end up going there all the time, basically. And uh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it was I got a quote. Friend. I got this is I, this is this is your grandfather. I think this is your grandfather. I got a quote from your grandfather. You said you're um, a magician's job is not to keep secrets, but to keep it for them. Yeah, it's um, the quote is um, magician's job is not to keep the secrets of magic from the audience, but to keep it for them. And as a true artist, it's stolen. Yeah. I don't know who he stole it from, <laughs> uh, but he stole it. Apparently, somebody told me a while back, and I was they like, did. Oh. <laughs> "They figured out the secret." And yeah. here's another quote that I got from you in your book. I don't want to put all your business out there with your book, but I just got little nuggets, and I was like, "You know, I'll share some. Maybe I won't get yeah. in trouble with her." Your why? Your why is that you want others to feel childlike wonder like your grandfather did for you. And most people only see one magician in their life and you want to be that person. Mm. Yeah, it yeah. comes with a big, big responsibility too. Like if people only see one magician or mentalist in their entire life, isn't it our responsible, like our responsibility for the arts to make sure that we are delivering the best possible show that we possibly can for them. And yeah. in that moment. You know, it's, it's crazy because I've always felt that way with just magic as a whole, where oftentimes I've done tricks on probably thousands of people just walking up to people on the street or when I was in school. And I've only done one, one live show at a college at a, it was a, at a Christian university. I did some mentalism and maybe I'll send you the video at some point in the future, but, uh, I, when I do the illusions, it's as if the, the people who could come talk to me afterwards, they, it's like they've never seen magic before. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how come magic's not, it's not like, not like music where everyone flocks to it. But the one thing if I think is this, and you tell me about my theory, there's a lot of magicians, but there's very few Every, most magicians are like a repeat of other magicians or they just kind of do uh, like if I'm scrolling on YouTube, you might see like on America's Got Talent, not knocking America's Got Talent, but a lot of the tricks that they do on there, it's like, oh, that's just something that you can buy on Amazon and you just perform it up there and they don't put like a unique twist to it. Cause I, I mean, obviously we all kind of do similar tricks, but they don't throw a unique twist to it. They just focus on the trick. And when I was watching your Ted talks, it's amazing how you're able to tell a story while doing the illusion. And I was showing one of my friends one of your 
TED Talks and they're like, she's a good storyteller. You're you're interviewing her? And I'm like, yeah, dude, this is going to be cool. So uh, <laughs> no pressure, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I mean, what do you think about that? Well, how come magic right now? I mean, I remember David Blaine, Chris Angel, Darren Brown, you know, Darren Brown. Yeah, of course. Obviously, you got to know Darren Brown. Yeah. Well, these Fantastic. are the guys. Huh? Fantastic. Absolutely. These were the guys that I always watched when I was in high school and just obsessed. I wanted to be like them. And but I just. I don't really feel like there's a whole, whole lot of other people out there that are com that are unique like that. You know what I mean? Mm, mm, definitely. Um, I think well, th like the first part of that, you um, you made me think about something that I heard about music. So some people can play a, a piano and some people can sing, but not a lot of people can do the two at the same time. And I feel like magic and mentalism is kind of the same thing. Like we are so focused on the effect that we are supposed to perform now, especially if we don't have a lot of experience. We just do the trick and then we move on. New trick or a story or a joke right. or whatever it is. We're not used to combining, a, telling a story or um, or just, you know, whatever it is. Because one of my mentors is Tom Stone and he taught me to be a spider and create a spider web so okay. you have all of your techniques and you have your methods and you have your props and you have your stories you have yourself you have your stage whatever it is that you have and your job is just to make sure that these intervene intervene as good as you possibly can and create right. a beautiful web um and not a lot of magicians and mentalists do that because they were never taught to do it that way they see David Blaine, or as you mentioned, or Darren Brown, or whoever it is, they see this one trick that they perform, and they buy the trick that they saw on Amazon or Vanishing Ink or whatever they found found the trick, and they take it and they perform it, and that's now they feel like I did it, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think that that's what we're supposed to do. I think we're supposed to filter all the stuff like in ourselves, like what do we want to portray out to this world, um, and and we have this big controversy kind of in magic now where we we ask ourselves the question if magic is art or not and we have right. people on both sides and but i don't think that magic can be art until we have filtered it through what we want it to be because then it's just you know duplicating what we already saw right and uh i wasn't even thinking about asking this but this just popped in my head because you were mentioning magic as art and you were talking about how you like to give people that childlike wonder and now with the i want to ask another magician i don't know how to word this i mean i'll just word it like this ethical is it is this ethical or i like to try to cause people to question what they know mm -hmm. i i i like to give people wonder too but i almost i like to do illusions that make people sit there like wait a second was that real or am I, I don't know what that is. I, I've been that way when I was a kid. My main focus, I'm like, I want to do illusions that make the adults feel like they almost have to question their belief systems for a moment. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you think about that. Is that a bad I thing? I think that's, um, that's a very mentalist thing too. Like you want to get into right. people's minds more than the visual <laughs> maybe. So I see what you're saying. Uh, maybe. So, okay. My director is a clown, a, pr a professional clown. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, he asked me when he was directing my first show, he asked me, uh, I don't care about the tricks that you do. I care about how you want to make these people feel. So what are they saying to each other when they walk out from after the show? And it's such a big question. Like, it's a small question, but it's such a big question. So, so I, this is my advice to everybody listening. No matter what your trade is, no matter what you do, Ask yourself this, what do you want the people who just saw you to talk about at the bar afterwards or in the stalls, you know, in whatever it is, wherever they are, what are they saying about the, you or about the show? What it, What is it? And for me, that was, I don't care if I fool them. That's not my job. It's my, it's my role as a magician to fool them, but that's not what I'm here for today. Right. I want people to walk out of that theater and say, oh, my God, I love Caroline. Do you think we can invite her for a dinner? That'd be amazing. Like, she's so funny. Oh, my God. That's the kind of feeling I want for them. Like, I want them to feel like 
They could ask me anything. We're here together. It's going to be a fantastic time. No matter if you sit in the audience or if you come up, everybody's going to feel like this is, we're doing this together. Like it's a yes. union. It's a, it's a community. And we're having a great time for 75 minutes or however long we get. Right. Um, and so that's the feeling I want uh, during the show, but also afterwards. Like if they see me on social media, they listen to an interview, they see me on TV. I want that always to be the case. Like they're always like, oh my God, I love her. She's so funny. She's great. Oh my God. Do you think she'll reply to my DM? And then when <laughs> I do, they get so excited, you know, because um, it's extending, you know, it's, it's not right. just here and now. Oh, this is Steven who's going to be part of this trick. Um, and then he reaches out to me again, like, oh my God, I saw your show. I was actually the guy on the, on the stage thing. You don't remember this, but I do remember it because they think, because I, I, I'm just standing on the stage and they think, oh my god she's a celebrity or whatever it is that they put on on right. me as their brand on me um but of course i remember i mean at tops i do four shows a week of course i'm gonna remember you if you text me next week truly do you think i'm gonna forget <laughs> i might not know what i had for breakfast yesterday because those things <laughs> i do forget because i don't pay attention but when you are a professional performer you can't just put on autopilot uh, autopilot and do the thing you have right. to be present and the shows that I feel sometimes, you know, you know, you, you're an entertainer too. Sometimes we don't feel like going to do the gig. Like we don't want to go. It's like, ah, uh, do I really have to do this today? This client really? Uh, and yeah. then you go there and then you have the best time. And I felt that I have the best time when I didn't really feel like doing it because then I have to be in the moment more. So I have to be like pushing myself that extra mile to be that professional magician that they hired yeah. and the probably the only one they're ever going to see. So now I'm super hyper focused. And then when Steven comes up, we're going to have a great time. Somebody takes a photo. Of course, I'm going to share this again because now <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, we had a great time. You know, but sometimes yeah. you're just, oh, OK, I'm doing this show today. Oh, it's going to be fun. And, and you do the show. And that's more of an auto autopilot thing for me instead right. of just trying to really hone into the situation like who are these people why is why am i bringing up this person and not that one right. um I, actually one time uh and i'm only telling you this because you're a, an entertainer too okay uh, one time <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was gonna bring up five people for toss out deck so i was gonna mind read five cards that people were thinking about nice um, i walk up to this one guy and he stands up and he is a god walking on earth he is <laughs> He is so gorgeous. He is so tall. He's his skin is just glowing. Uh, has this beautiful dark brown eyes. Um, and I'm just said I'm a tall woman. I, I'm five eleven, and he is like way up there. And I'm in heels too, so I'm like you know super high up. You're five eleven in heels. No, that's without the heels. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. And then I look up and I'm like, no, I can't do this. I have a boyfriend. You sit back down. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no, because <laughs> uh, I knew in that moment, like, I cannot interact with this person because he's a god. <laughs> I got you. Oh, amazing. See, it's gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be real with you. So I think I came across your content, I think, in 2019. I think I was looking up tutorials and I was trying to learn the business side of magic. And, but I think you're one of the people I came across. And, um, when I heard that you were gonna announce a book, I was like, Oh snap, I got to get on this quick. So you were doing a, I don't know if you were doing a live video. I think you were doing a live video and I commented saying, like, Hey, like when's the book going to come out? I think I probably asked for like a signed copy or something, but you, you only got it in digital, right? Mm, for right now. Yeah. Okay, y are you gonna get it? Uh, paperback. Yes. So uh, there's a publisher in London that reached out to me because he said the same thing that you did. It's not just for magicians; it's for people who go on stages. So it's for public speakers, actors, mentalists, singers, whatever. So Amazing. it's uh, we're gonna spread it globally as yeah. a business book. Well. So I, I, as I talk to you, I, I I almost come to you as a student. I'm getting your life story and everything, but I almost come to you as a student. Cause I, yeah, I'm an entertainer, but I've only done one show. Mainly, I just on the streets or at Bible studies and different things. So I got 
I got one more question I want to ask you about kind of like the business set of magic. All right. So it's, I want to perform as a, as a mentalist and, and I, I want to do like more, more than mentalism as well, but I really want to be able to perform mentalism and have that be like a full-time career. And I'm going through your book. There's a lot of good nuggets in there, especially when you got into the social media aspect and then the QR code, and then you have Calendly, Calendly and um, you, there's a lot of things. So I'm like, I'm writing stuff down. I think I got to go through it again just to mm-hmm. make sure. But I, I don't. I really don't know where to start. I really don't know. I'm working a full time job right now, and maybe I need to pay you for consulting me right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, I'll send you a PayPal request. <laughs> I work a full-time job right now, and then I try to do the podcast because you just turn on the camera and you start talking, and so at least I get some content out, Mm. but I really want to be able to perform. And specifically, not even just to get paid for a live show, I would like to do it social media, you know. I mean, I don't know what I'm asking you. Do you have any tips for me? Have you started telling people that you perform for money? No, I haven't. That's, That's a good place to start. Yeah. yeah. Everywhere, everywhere on LinkedIn, on your website, on when meeting people, like when me meeting that priest yesterday who was going to do the baptism. Yes, I do magic. Scan my QR code. He got to my LinkedIn. He was like, oh, I don't use LinkedIn. No worries. Can I borrow your phone? Right in your website. This is where you find me. Every time, even in my personal life, with, when I'm with my kids at the park, I'm always a entertainer for hire. So if I get into a conversation, I always drop like um, if I'm with my kids in the park, I would say because we have twins. It's <laughs> it's a different story. We have twin toddlers. They're two and a half years old. It's crazy. Right. Um, but sometimes I'm there by myself and this mom or dad would come up to me and be like, I, I don't know how you do this. You know, two kids, I can barely stand one or whatever. And then I always mention that my partner is home a lot with them because I work as an entertainer globally. And right. they're always like, what? What do you do? Are you a singer? And I was like, no, I actually perform magic for a living. And yeah. they all go, what? Are you are you joking right now? And then I start asking them questions. OK, so where do you work? So you saw the what, did you see the one with the vanishing cookie or the van- vanishing ships? Do you remember you, the, the one I messaged you or commented? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you yeah. did the vanishing cookie one. The cookie. So about two or three days later, I was on a flight uh, with a guy or, or with a woman who had just been promoted as head of marketing for uh, Lays. Is that how you say it? the the chips? L. Oh yeah, Lays. Y S. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and I was like, I showed her this uh, this video, and she's like, Oh my god, that's great! Could you please do it with chips? And I was like, Give me two days. And so I recorded the same one with the chips, and she <laughs> loved it. Um, we haven't booked the show yet, but I'm thinking it's going to come that way. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a great way too. like if you talk to people, um, ask them, what are they doing? What's their position? Oh, have you ever hired professional entertainers for your events before? Oh, that's interesting. Oh, you've never tried mentalism. Oh, you know what? Can I try something on you real quick? Yeah. And then you get into it, you know, uh, but it feels like it's not selling anything because you're just there hanging out with your kids at the park. That's a good point. That's a, actually that's a very good point. That's very simple, and and I it's I know that in the back of my head, right? But let me say this real quick. So I've always had this thought in my mind: What if you get into it and then you start hating it because now it's a job? Now you're getting paid to do it. Now I have to be here. <laughs> yeah, scary, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not scared of it, but I, I mean, did you ever deal with that? Yeah, today. <laughs> okay. Uh, I mean, um, today I've been in the office all day and I came in this morning and I was like, I think I forgot how to work because <laughs> I've been taking so much time <laughs> off this year uh, with my dad. And also I've been doing a lot of cruise ships and I've been taking some maternity yeah. leave because Sweden is the best country. Uh, we take, well, we get 660 days paid parental leave when we have twins, which means I can stay home part time until they're four years old, which is fantastic. Amazing. So, yes, yeah, so I've been, you know, going back and forth a lot this year, which, which has been very good. Um, but sometimes, you know, um, 
sometimes you just have to decide and yeah. uh, do something every day that your future self will thank you for. That's something that I try to do every day. Amazing. Uh, yeah. And so if you ever feel like, oh, I want to try this mentalism thing out, maybe you can ask your boss for six months off or even, you know, a year off and see what they say. Um, maybe in exchange for a couple of uh, a couple of party stuff uh, would be great, right. maybe. Uh, but you don't have to go all in at once. I think the best way is to start telling people that you are an entertainer for hire. And if they want to, to, to you know, use your services or whatever, then you perform some gigs here and there. And um, there's always going to be people in the audience who knows somebody who is who needs people for another conference or for another festival or whatever right. it is. So the that's kind of what I meant before. Like it continues after the show. There is exactly. there's no stopping here. Like um today I was going through my calendar because this is the first day back after the summer holiday. So I was writing down all of the clients I had uh, this spring. So I wrote down all the names of them, which date it was, what we did if I can remember anything specific about that event, uh, so then tomorrow I can reach back out to them again and say, I hope you had a lovely summer. Are you planning anything this year? I would love to do, you know, this and this for you guys. So if I, let's say I did a walk around uh, in February, I'll try to pitch for the Christmas show now uh, for December instead. Or if I already did the show um, and say something fun about the show, I always have photos on my phone. So I can always right. you know, refer back to those. If I wanted to, I can even add them into the emails and be like, I had such a great time with you guys. Um, I saw this and this on the news. So just a quick Google search. Um, and I would love to be the host or MC at your next conference. How can we make this a reality? Uh, so instead of just pitching, hire me again, hire me again, give them something of value. Say, I loved this and this and this. This is interesting that you guys are going on right now. Um, and then I would love this opportunity. Can we talk about this? Instead of saying, hire me again. Amazing. Very big, very di big difference there. I'm surprised you don't got your own booking agency. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do, actually. Oh, you do? <laughs> do okay. Uh, uh, well, I don't have it, you know, a, a business that is like that. But okay. I refer a lot of other uh, acts. That okay. Way, yeah. That's amazing. All right. So enough trying to get advice. I'm going to go back into your story. So you talked about kind of a little bit you were bullied when you were in school and that you, you I, I think i saw in your book and then also in one of your ted talks i think as well you were bullied in school you're one of those kids that you're always left out and i vaguely remember you saying something about you wanted to become the best magician in the world mm -hmm. and so i've had all those same things i love yeah. it <laughs> i want you to tell me about it I think I dropped the being the best magician in the world thing. Um, okay. <laughs> but I, uh, I do think that it's hard to beat me on a stage because it's a I, good mentality to have though. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I want to be a, a great magician. Like I want everybody to, to look at my show and be like, that was great, you know? Uh, but it's not about the fooling for me. And yeah. I kind of feel the same way when I'm watching Copperfield's show. Um, he is, he is so, uh, into that story more than he is about the tricks. And, mm. and that's been a transition for him, you know, over decades, really. Um, and I think for me, it's, um, I want to be unbeatable on stage. So that's why I do as much as I possibly can. I do as many shows as I possibly can. And I, I take on cruise ships, uh, not very long contracts though, but I take on cruise ships still when I have young kids so the first cruise back i believe the kids were only seven months old or something um wow and you know a and lot you got of people... four kids no i got two okay <laughs> yeah i always say it's my first my second and my last never doing this again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh no but truly it's uh people do judge me though like when i go on these beautiful cruise ships and whatever um and they always say but if you're here who's taking care of the kids um and, you know, you could be funny. You can be like, oh, I, I left the tap open or I, the TV's on or whatever you want. But apparently they have a dad. I didn't do this to myself, <laughs> you know, on accident or anything. Right. Um, but, yeah, I think people will judge you no matter what you do with your life. And I think um, for me, it's very important to feel like um, like I am I am where I'm supposed to be. 
So when it just be, like taking this, like the kids and entertaining and traveling and all of that stuff into consideration, I, I really had a hard, long, like sit down with myself where I was right. like, I want to be the best possible parent that I can be. And for me to be able to be that person or that parent to my kids, I have to be able to still do what I love. And I love being on a stage. I love Amazing. being a creator. Yeah. And as if I get that, I can still come home and be a, a great mom to my kids uh, and also a better partner. Cause if I was not getting out of my own life, what I wanted for myself or what right. I have worked so hard to create for myself, um, then I would start to resent the kids and my partner and myself. And that is not a very healthy relationship for anybody to be in. Yeah. Wow. The, hey, I love that. I got two questions I want to ask you. Let me ask you this. What do you want? What's your vision now? Because you say <laughs> you're like, you're yeah, like, OK, I, I just want. Well, no, well, never mind. You kind of just explained it to me a little bit. You you said that you want to be a great mother. And, you know, I was going to when you when you said that you wanted to be the greatest magician, I was going to ask you, what was your vision? Like, did you want to have a television show or something? Did you want to what does that look like for you? Well, I know you said you don't want to be the greatest. Well, I, I don't have to necessarily be the best magician, but yeah. I want to be the best person on stage. Exactly. So that makes sense. I want to. Yeah. So it's um, I, I do believe that the future for magic is not male. Like I think it's or like the white male that we are used to seeing. <laughs> I think we're done with that. Um, I think the next great magician is either going to be trans or a woman or somebody of color. Um, because we're seeing a switch in the world, like things are changing for a lot of different people uh, about about time, <laughs> if, if I'm all right. So uh, I think I think definitely that it's going to be somebody else that we haven't seen before. And sometimes when I'm having a really great day, you know, sometimes you just get I'm an entertainer. My ego is big. So sometimes I can sit by myself and I'd be like, OK, so if the future of magic <laughs> is female, who better than me <laughs> can take that spot? <laughs> Uh, and I have this like a whole situation where I'm sitting to myself, like drinking a cup of coffee and be like, yeah, I'm going to take over the world. Yes. Um, but I don't necessarily have to be best at magic. Yes. However, I want people to come to my show um, and have a great time, the greatest time that they can have. Um, and again, the, con the show continues afterwards. Absolutely. So always feel like uh, like they, they loved it. And we mentioned this before, like music and stuff. Um, I, I always have this envy of um, of artists that are not magicians, like uh, singers and people who play piano. People have a favorite piece, like a favorite song that they can listen to 70 times a day. They don't right. care about how it was created. They just love listening to what was composed and sung or whatever it was. They love that. Uh, but magic doesn't get that, does it? Only for magicians. That's, we can yeah, watch yeah. a perfect pass a million times and we can be like, oh, that's great. The hours spent. Um, but we don't get that from from a lay audience. They, they right. will never come to see my show again uh, to see that one specific trick, probably. Yeah. Instead, they are expecting to see a different show every time. That is very true. Yeah. Yeah. And I envy that. Like they, they get something know. else. Right, right. So... Can we, can you tell me what questions I'm allowed to ask you, what I can't ask you? I wanted to go back to when you were in <laughs> theology school and when you became, uh, got into preaching. And the reason why I say, you tell me if you don't want to talk about it, because I know it, it might lead down like talking about spiritual beliefs and different things, but I'm very curious about it. And That's I don't know right. if you, I don't know if you watched any of my podcasts at all, um, but like. I've skimmed it. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Well. I, I interview a lot of people who believe in God and different things. And I'm trying to expand. I want to talk to people of all kinds of backgrounds. And so this right here is pretty new for me, talking to a magician rather than somebody who's preaching, you know. And Same thing. But I'm really – say it again? Same thing. <laughs> so – Free choice. It's yes. Free choice. <laughs> Tell me. And then you also said when you were in theology school and then you started preaching, and then when you got into magic, that made you really popular. You, 
so let's go back to the beginning of that. What, why did you get into theology school and why did you start preaching? Tell me about that story. So I, uh, so f- trying to arch the entire story, okay. super bullied in school. And then when you're 14 in Sweden, you get the invitation for a confirmation. So, um, so you'll do, um, I think it's nine months of reading the Bible in church. And then afterwards you have a big graduation thing and you'll get presents and there's cake, fantastic news. And then uh, everything is done for, like you're done. You don't have to do anything again. But there's always two to four extra young people in the church who are helping out with uh, with the conferments. So they will be bringing out pens and they will make sure that they sit down in church and they'll hand out candles or whatever it is. They get to go to camps, an extra camp, fantastic news. And they also get an extra bun every single Wednesday. And so when they asked me, if I wanted to be a youth leader, I said, sure, you know, this is going to be fantastic. It's going to be great. I'm going to have a great time and I'm going to eat so many buns. Uh, and I did. <laughs> uh, so I ended up going or starting with only one group. And then I had more and more groups every year. So um, I was after a couple of years, I was the, the head of the youth group. So I was taking care of like everything that we were doing and all the trainings of the leaders and going on camps. I was planning the camps. At one point I was doing 16 camps per season. So that was very busy. Amazing. Um, All volunteer, of course, because it was apparently not a real job. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) But uh, it was, it was tough. It was really tough. Got me very organized though. So that I did. And then after, after. Probably where a lot of your business skills came from. Oh yeah. 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 (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So when, uh, when I was done with high school and it was time to to apply for university and stuff, it was very clear to me that I only had one path to go, really, and that was continuing in the church way. So I took the first year to to be a volunteer in a church in a different city. And then after that, I started studying theology. Um, so I did a total of five and a half years of university studies. So that's a very long time to then remember that no this is not what i want to do <laughs> uh but no i had a great time though i learned so much i yeah. learned so much about talking to people and giving value and how to really listen instead of just being you know when you're in a conversation or especially arguments or whatever it is um people have this tendency to sit and wait and just you know they have this thing that they want to say in the back of their head so they don't really listen Right. So they just wait and then they say it. And then they're like, oh, but I just said that. No, you didn't. I said it better. Whatever. Right. Um, and so I learned very actively to listen to people and take a pause and then respond. And that's a really suited very well for the type of show that I do now. So whenever I bring people up, I, I ask them genuine questions. And most of the times I will even hand them a microphone and give them a, a reason to respond to something. Uh, and it's become such a like a pillar of the shows that I feel like without that, if, if we take that like away, it's not going to be as fun for me to perform. Right. And I think that's why the pandemic hit me so hard because it wasn't the same to do a show virtually. Of course, it did shows virtually because we had to like this was this is my life. This is what I do. Um, so I still had to do the shows virtually. Um, but I really missed that conversation of having somebody come up and I will ask a random question and then they will respond and then it'd be like that's very interesting and then the entire audience will react to this too but that doesn't work on zoom because then it's there's always a delay and it's always a oh I am no 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 you're, Michael you're muted <laughs> or whatever it is it doesn't have the same impact so coming back again it was it was so, such a relief to be to be able to talk to people again and to be able to feel like I'm connected to not only you as the person that I'm doing as a volunteer, this is you pick the card, but also the entire room is back open. You know, it's all of a sudden this person says something that's hilarious. I can look out to the crowd and I can say what a weirdo he is or whatever it is. <laughs> and, and it's created this, this fantastic feeling. And I, I truly remember the first year of coming back every show after every show, I was like shaking. Because it was, I was so right. high on the andre- adrenaline again. It's like I've really missed this. Wow. I mean, 
the money is fine. You know, it's that's one thing is losing the money, losing the going out to do gigs and stuff. But that feeling of we did this together, that was the one thing that I missed the most. Uh, and actually, my very first show back after the pregnancy. So I did I did shows up until week 34 with the twins, which was crazy. Yeah. Um, but I, I did shows up until that point. Uh, it was still the pandemic, so I was not able to do very many shows in person, but I did one um, week 34. And then I came back after the boys were three weeks old and I came to a, um, a company where uh, they, they actually brought halloumi cheese and feta cheese to Sweden. So when I saw the <laughs> guy who was the, the person who brought it in, I was like, thank you, sir. <laughs> Um, but I did this show for them and, and I opened the show with, um, with tossed out deck where I read the minds of five people. And, and during that, I, I say, or I said, uh, I know what you're thinking. She looks amazing for somebody who just had twins three weeks ago. And it was not supposed to be a showstopper, right. <laughs> but this one woman, it was like 50 people in the audience, very small company. This one woman, she stands up and she's like, wait, what? Are you joking right now? Like, did you wow. really just have twins three weeks ago? And I was like, yes. And so we ended up having to sit <laughs> and talk about this. So somebody pulled up a chair and I sat down and we had like a little business meeting. Uh, <laughs> and we talked about this. They all forgot about their cards. <laughs> like there, was, there was no way of coming back to the trick after that. So we just left it, let it be. Right. Uh, but she was like, we have to talk about this fact. Um, and then somebody <laughs> came up after the show and he was like, um, you know, the first three weeks, my wife wouldn't even let me leave the house for an hour. <laughs> and I was like, what? What are you even saying? Like, how how are people having these dysfunctional lives where they feel like just because they have a child or in our case, right. two, you can't live anymore. Like, yes, I as I said, I want to be I want to be living my own life no matter if i'm you know there's a pandemic or i'm pregnant or i have two kids that i have to take care of um it's still my life and it's still my responsibility to make sure that i am as happy and healthy as i can possibly be because we never know when this is over like my dad passed away at 63 that's not an age like it's ridiculous you should have had at least 20 more years yeah so, so we never know we never know so it's my responsibility and everybody who's listening to this, it's your responsibility to make sure that your life is as impactful and as joyful and as full as you want it to be. Because, uh, I mean, who else is going to take care of that for you? Nobody, because they're busy doing their own stuff. Absolutely. I think it's, isn't it Piglet in uh, Winnie the Pooh who says something like that? Um, Piglet. <laughs> yeah, Piglet. I think he says something like... Uh, if I am the only one thinking about me, everybody else just thinks about themselves or something like that. And it's, and it's very cute. It's fantastic. Yeah, that is that is very true. I'm the yeah. only one thinking about me. Everyone else think about themselves. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah. wow, that is amazing. So now, OK, when you first got started in your career. What were you thinking? in the beginning where you were like, okay, I don't know. What were you envisioning at the time compared to where you are now? Oh, wow. Um, so I've been doing this full time for 10 and a half years, um, which is not a very long time, but it feels like forever. <laughs> uh, when I, when I decided to do this full time, um, I, I wasn't, I, I didn't know what I was doing. If I'm being honest, like I didn't know, nobody right. told me. That's also why I wrote this book because nobody would share any any secrets at all, except for which glue to get for whatever prop you needed to build. Apparently, people share that all the time. Um, but I think I wanted to be the next, you know, big magician name. Like I wanted to be uh, Joe Libero is the biggest one here. I wanted to be, you know, famous as Joe Libero because that's like. I put him on like a pedestal or something. Right. Um, but as it kind of progressed, I noticed that I did not like kids' parties. I did not like retirement homes. I did not like performing outside. Um, I got very picky in the type of shows that I could do. And and because I am, I don't want to say this, but I have to say this, uh, because I am a woman, it was kind of easy for me to become famous in the industry. 
So I you was, said it was I, easy. Easy with these brackets. Oh, uh, okay. Easier, I guess. Easier. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, it's because uh, you, you break so many norms. Like uh, every time, still, I go out perform. People tell me I've never seen a woman do magic before, or you know, all, all that stuff. And in the beginning, they would even sometimes when I talk to them on the phone, they'd be like, um, <laughs> like what was that? They were saying um, it doesn't hurt that you are a woman or something like that. It was. Like I would sit in there and talk it, it to them. It sounds like it's supposed to be nice, but it's kind of. Yeah, it's kind of weird and sexist and strange. And please not say that to me. And don't send me photos of corsets you think I should be wearing on stage because that's weird. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was in the beginning, it was kind of easy for me to to get noticed. So for the first, yeah. you know, six months or whatever. Um, oh, actually, I'll show you something. Let me have it here. Mm, yep. Here. This is a uh, exclusive. <laughs> I do not share this to everybody. Heck uh, yeah. This is a uh, the very first cover I ever did. Uh, oh wow. Compare this to this. So yeah. <laughs> what does the first one say? Liku, Liku Slanten. It's um, from a magazine, like uh no no, no yeah. magazine. it's from a it's from a bank. And so um, they're like, they're, both of those, they're, you're being promoted on there. It's, mm -hmm. that's, that's amazing. And that's so when you first one, got started. Yeah, this one came out um, in 2014. I think it was in May. And I quit my job in February. So within wow. months, um, I was on the cover. It's not a big, how did that, okay. Time. You Hold on, hold on. Explain <laughs> that. So, well, okay, because I, I read about it, but you didn't. I don't know if you really went into detail, like how it happened. Yeah, did you get on TV too? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, what? <laughs> how did that so happen? It started with me calling the local newspaper, saying, "Hey, my name is Caroline. I want to quit church to become a full-time magician." And they were like, "This is fun." So they came to my place. I did some tricks for them. They did a beautiful interview with me, and it was printed in the local newspaper. And, and someone who worked in an even bigger newspaper read that one, did another big one within like a week or two after. Uh, and then somebody saw that who worked here and they printed this in 504,000 copies. Uh, and this was brought to every child who is nine, 10 and 11 years old. So everybody in school gets these. So we had this beautiful, a uh, poster that it came with and we have uh there's this interview with uh, oh actually it asks me maybe i can i should revisit this um because <laughs> i'm sure i answered a lot of questions in here and we have these photos um and they asked me who was my favorite magician i believe thank you that's what i was gonna ask you <laughs> uh, it i'm sure it's changed um, it says here, age 24. 24. That's, that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> but th um, that's crazy, yeah. man. Interesting. So, uh, but yeah, this is where it started. And yeah. uh, I guess this is how it's going. This is the Vanish magazine. And they do two covers in every issue. So it's Uri Geller on the back. Um, what? So that's really cool. Oh, wait. Okay. So that one was more recent, right? Yeah. More recent. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. So let me ask you a question did you did you grow up in an entrepreneurial type family no no my parents well, didn't I, even finish high school wait a second though you can't do this caroline you can't do this <laughs> i can do anything i can do anything <laughs> what how did that just pop into your mind though to just call a news station like just was that like a marketing just it was from church i knew that's how you got sponsors and stuff that makes so... sense yeah, so I had, I had called newspapers in the past and um, I was on like the board of the church, um, like regionally. So I, I knew some people, which was okay. Great. So, that makes um, sense. Yeah, so it was kind of easier that way to get into. Uh, but because of this interview that made it <laughs> into every child's home, um, right. someone who worked with uh, a kid's TV show saw it. And they wanted to do a review of magic sets. So they asked me to come on. Yeah. Uh, so I taught them some tricks and stuff. And it was great. And they did an amazing job. Uh, 
But I remember so many magicians being so angry because I had only been doing this for a couple of months and they have been doing this <laughs> for years and years. And they are like, why does she get that spot? Um, and that's kind of what I mean by it was easier yeah. for me because I was a woman. I was rare. I was new. I was young. I was pretty. We're all <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, you know, they weren't because they were uh, washed up white men in big suits because they didn't know how to market themselves. They didn't know that the times have changed because magicians are so behind, usually. Um, that is true. Yeah, we're so behind. We don't listen. We don't take in fashion. We don't use social media the way that we're supposed to do or whatever it is. And, yeah. and the very few people who do, they will blow up. And you just have to learn how to kind of ride that wave. And, and see yes. You. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That makes, that makes sense though. Like you kind of, that's what you had to do for the church. You almost made me feel like I had a low IQ for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm sure that's not true. I'm like, that's the first thing that popped in your head. You're like, okay, boom, marketing plan. I need to get on the news. <laughs> yeah. So um, <laughs> let me ask you this real quick. So I know we kind of started early the time zones were messed up how much time do i got with you you let me know um i have about 30 minutes okay cool so now when you got into that and then you're saying that you know a lot of the magicians out there were there other magicians that were trying to get that spot already there were... probably it, okay. it was a long yeah. time ago so i don't remember yeah. but I, I remember people being angry about it in, in this yeah. We have this um, Swedish Magic Circle Facebook group, and somebody shared the clip on there, and people were angry in the comments. I felt so welcome. <laughs> and people wonder why there are so few female magicians or um, magicians of color or trans magicians. It's like every time we do something and something slightly off of what it's supposed to be, yeah. we get so much hatred. And of course, we're not going to feel welcome, but I feel like it's been getting better. Like when I started it like 10 years ago, it was much worse than it is now. Yeah. Or maybe it's just because I've made a name for myself and they don't dare anymore. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm kind of feeling a change in the climate. I like that though, because I mean, you, you're, you're not intentionally trying to be, what's the word I'm looking for? Controversial. Mm. But I like it though, because it makes noise. What, whatever it is that you're doing, I dig it. Yeah. Now, <laughs> thank you. We could go. I'm trying to make sure I don't forget nothing. I want to extract as much out of your brain as I can. It's what was brain. it like? What was it like when you first got on TED Talk? But leading up to that, how did you get to the point where they wanted you on? Did you apply or something? Or was it like a, they saw you somewhere on like in a magazine? And then mm -hmm. once you realize you're going to get on to a TED Talk, what was that feeling like? So to tell this story, we have to go back to possibly, mm, I want to say September 2017. Um, I was doing a, a free show, which I rarely do, just a free random, you know, gig here and there. Uh, I do charity events, different thing. Uh, but I was part of a big network and they asked me to do this one trick uh, for the big audience uh, who was going to be there for like an after work kind of situation. I had brought nothing. Uh, business cards, because I still handed out business cards at the time because I didn't know about the QR code you can have on your phone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But no, I was having some business cards um, and this uh, this guy who ran the network, he asked me to do a trick and I was like, "Ugh, what can I do? So I did the magic square. And as of, you know, coincidence or chance or whatever, I got the weirdest and loudest heckler I've ever had up until this point And even after I've never met a heckler as big as this one. <laughs> um, and in the audience, there's this woman named Charlotte. Um, a beautiful, same age as me, super cool, leather jackets, tattoos everywhere, rings everywhere, big, big earrings. And, you know, she's kind of short and she has blonde hair. Um, gorgeous woman. 
So she comes up to me after and she says, you know what? I was going to walk out when they said there was this magician here, but you are really cool. I would like to represent <laughs> you. My name is Charlotte. I am a booking agent. And I was like, who are you? Like, I've I've been doing this my entire career up until this point by myself. I felt like I knew what I was doing. Um, and But we ended up having a coffee and then later on five more coffees. Um, and she basically took my entire business and and broke down it into pieces like okay this is what we need to do with this this is what we need to do, do about this and this pricing is not going to work so we have to do this with pricing uh she was very like uh hands on right away um and then uh like 2 months later i decided that that was going to go on a on a national tour 2018 and she was like Caroline, I love it, but you have all of these ideas and they're like balls and you toss all of them up in the air and you just close your eyes and you hope <laughs> that I catch one of them. <laughs> um, and uh, and she was right. And that's what I do. I have a million ideas and I toss them up and I hope that somebody in my team will catch some of them. And that's what we do. Um, and she really took on to this idea of the tour. Uh, so that's what we did. The premiere of Where the Magic Happens, the original show. There's a version of it on YouTube, but the original Where the Magic Happens uh, premiered May 5th, 2018. And during the process of working with the clown that I mentioned before, um, creating this beautiful story that I wanted to tell, um, during that process, Charlotte also represented a guy named Michael, and he was producing a TEDx talk. So she was talking to Michael and Michael was like, who do you have like in your stable or people, you know, that who's inspirational and who has never done anything like this before. And she was like, well, there's Carolina, but I'm, she's really busy, but I'm, maybe <laughs> I can ask her. Um, and and she, he asked me, uh, Michael called me up and, um, and I said, when is it? And he said, May 8th. And remember, premiere was May 5th. <laughs> uh, and I was right. like, oh, okay. tight tight, tight, tight. But I said, yes, because right. I always say yes first. And then I can always change my mind later if I don't want to do it anymore. I feel you. Hey, I learned that. <laughs> yeah. So I said, yes, let's make it happen. So when we created Where the Magic Happens, we also had to keep in mind to create something that would also work for a TEDx talk because I could not prepare two different things at the same time uh, and do a great job on both of these. Right. So May 5th happened. Um, I got event hungover. Like, uh, I don't know if you've had this, but when you go out and do a big show, the next day you're so hungover, no matter if you drank or not, like you would be in bed, <laughs> like in fetal position for hours. Um, I had one glass of champagne in the limo because somebody told me to book a limo after the premiere of your first national show. I had one glass of champagne. And actually my brother the other day, like this weekend, as we're speaking right now, this weekend, he uh, he told me, I've only seen Caroline drunk once, and that was in the back of a limousine. I was like, <laughs> one glass of champagne. <laughs> that doesn't count because I don't drink much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so that happened. And then so the next day, May 6th, I was out. I was so tired. And then May 7th, they flew me up to the north of Sweden where we were recording it. And I brought a friend with me named Jesper. And so we were just re rehearsed the entire day. Um, and this... When you create these TEDx talks, uh, they will uh, live stream the, the the talks, so you will see it live if you right. if you want to. You can pay for it, of course, but you can see it live. Um, and then afterwards, they will edit the the video, and you get the video, and then that's the end of the story. Um, but in this case, I wanted something very specific for the opening. Um, I wanted a vanish of a of a silk because that's why we opened where the magic happens. But they, they got the lighting wrong and we practiced it for a while. And then we tried the lighting and we started a live stream. But I could see on the monitor that it didn't look as I wanted it to look. Mm. So I, I just said in the in the microphone, so sorry, guys, we're going to have to do this again. Because um, cause this is what we have to remember. Like right. when we do something like a TEDx talk or whatever it is, that's going to be edited afterwards, even a podcast. Right. So if we're doing something that's going to be edited afterwards, if you're not happy, it's 100% okay. It's 110% okay to say, let's do a reover, like retake. We need it to be good. And and the TED people, TED.com people, they want this to be shareable. They want it to be great. So exactly there, right. Yeah. And if you get an opportunity like this, make sure you nail it, really nail it. And 
take hours if you can with the technical people to make this work. Like people don't think about this. People don't think that you can ask the lighting director or the camera director or whatever it is to have a rehearsal, but you can even demand a technical rehearsal. And you probably should if you want this to be really good. Right. Um, but yeah, so I, I was like, oh, no, this, we can't do this. And the, um, the woman who was the MC, she had uh, ran to the bathroom to do a quick change of her clothing. And so she was like mid dressed down, <laughs> like microphone right. every, hanging everywhere. She was like, oh, no, they're calling my name. She had to run out. Uh, we're, we're great friends now, uh, but she was so stressed in that situation. Uh, and then afterwards, right. we've done it, and then everything is good. So from saying yes to it being done, there was a million, a million thoughts going through my head. One of them being, of course, there is not enough time. I can never do this. I will never make a great TEDx talk. Um, and then at the end, it was very much like, I'm so happy I said yes to this because I learned so much. Like I've learned so much about myself, about public speaking. Yes. And just having this TEDx speaker gives you so much authority. My goodness. Just putting that on LinkedIn. Uh, now mine says 5X TEDx speaker. Right. That's oh my cool. God, that's crazy. Who can say that? Who can say that they've done five TEDx talks? That's not a lot of people. Um. I don't know any other people, actually. Uh, that is amazing. Yeah, it is. And so now every time that I pitch myself as the uh, like at the MC of a big event um, or the host, it's always added in the pitch. Like, yes. Uh, so as when I did my five uh, TEDx talks, whatever, this is something that I've added or whatever it is. Just mentioning it, they're like, whoa. Or if I... Um, if I reach out to somebody on LinkedIn, that's one of the first thing that they say, they, they're going to be like, Oh, that's really interesting. Wow. Hey, I love it. <laughs> you got a business mindset. That's why people need to get your book. It's a great book. I mean, I spent so much time on that book. That's not true. I wrote it in three months, uh, in <laughs> Egypt. It, yeah. yeah <laughs> sorry. Writing it while the kids were sleeping. Um, but I spent so much, you know, thought about this. Like I literally took all the pieces in my business and I wrote everything down on post-it notes. I always have post-it notes lying right, right next to me. I wrote every single thing down, everything I knew, everything I wish I knew 10 years ago. And I just put everything up on my wall. So you can't see it here, but uh, I'm in a big office space. It's a co-office. So you will literally right outside of my office, there is a big staircase going down and up, obviously. Uh, but people will see my room from everywhere in this big space. And I have a huge window. So my window would be packed with post-it notes for, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks, just moving them around, changing colors, building That's a cool. system. Uh, yeah. And so everybody would be like knocking on my door and be like, what are you doing in here? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> uh, and they loved it, of course. And they came in. Some people even bought the book. And now that I, since I, this is my first day back, the uh, site manager downstairs, she was like, Caroline, I know you released the book. Can we please have a release party? And I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so because it was kind of like the talk of the town here because everybody was seeing all of these post-it notes. Like right. we're talking hundreds post-it notes on a wall. It's crazy. Amazing. So is today like first technically your first day back? Yeah. Dude, right on. Yeah. See, you gave me that time. I appreciate I that. I did. Yeah, and you were late. I'm kidding. No. I'm kidding. Was I late or was it nine no, o'clock? No, no. I was early. You're... I was eager. Because I was like, oh, man, I hope that this doesn't confirm that black people are always late. What is that thing? In America, we black oh, people really? are always late. I didn't know this. Um, I didn't know this. Yeah. I got a question for you. Kind of a personal question. You let me know if it's too personal. Do we need a safe word? No. A safe word? <laughs> <laughs> no. And and let me double check and verify. Was I late or no, I think what, it was time? Tony who uh who okay, the wrong cool. Time. I just want to double check. I, I think she put the wrong time in my calendar. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, uh now I'll just shoot. What do you believe? Oh, what do if I it's believe? too personal, just let That's me know. Good, are we talking religiously? Yeah, 
because you, you went to theology school, you preach, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you, you've probably had some things change in your life, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe you've questioned things and stuff. And I always like to just dig into someone's mind, like their, their heart and their soul. What do you believe in? Where, like, almost like questions, like, what do you think about when you go to bed at night? What do you, what do yeah. you wake up thinking about? I know you're a magician. You're great at what you do. I watched, I think I watched all the Ted talks. I love your work. I watch your YouTube channel. I'm jealous of you on Instagram. You're over there in Egypt, you know, doing all <laughs> kinds of stuff. And I'm like, okay, you know, and I wanted to make this podcast interesting and I wanted mm -hmm. to get into your heart a little bit. And mm -hmm. I know we're running out a little bit out of time, but like, oh, that's fine. Let's, let's, let's dig into what do you believe in? Well, I have two tattoos. The first one I got when I was 18 years old, it was a gift from my sister. And it's in the back of my neck, and I don't think I've ever shared you know, it on social media. I actually media. saw it for the first time. On, oh, yeah? I, I was watching a TED Talk one of yours last night that I was like, wait, I missed this one. And I was watching it, and then you turned over, and I saw it on the back of your neck a little bit. I was like, I didn't know she had a tattoo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got it when I was 18. Cool. It says, designed by God. And uh, so I came home. I showed it to my dad, who wanted to be funny. He said, oh, that's not true. You were made in Ostop. <laughs> and also is this redneck area <laughs> and i was like thanks dad <laughs> um and then afterwards because you can see it it's in the back of my neck and after a while he was like how why would they spell it m-a-i-d and that like housekeeper i was like <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> thanks dad <laughs> um but no so that was my first one so i guess what do i believe um you could be as I, I still I still stand forward. by it though. I stand okay. by it. I stand by that I think if there is a God, I believe that we were all designed and not just created. I think there's a reason for everybody and everybody is put here not just to like by accident. I think everybody has a purpose to fill, no matter if that's like um like somebody that you just meet randomly or if it's somebody who comes into your life. I think there's a, a design system to that. Of course we all have free free will, but I think if God exists, that which I'm not sure of, um, I believe that there is this design element to it, um, yeah. which kind of contradicts saying there is a free will. Um, but I believe that people are put and people and situations are put into our lives for reasons. And then it's our job to use our intuition and our experiences to to make the most out of that. Um, I don't go to church anymore. I went yesterday because there was a baptism. It was important for me to baptize my kids. Yeah. Very important to me. Um, I still carry the, the tattoo. I'm not ashamed of it. But I sometimes feel like I wish I, I wanted to believe more. Because mm. life, you know what? I think religion is a lot like a language. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. And when I was working in church, it was very natural for me to continue. And it was natural for me to study theology. Um, but as soon as I stopped, it wasn't natural anymore. Um, and yesterday when I was in the church, I was, you know, I know the songs. I know the texts. Yeah. I, can, I can do this. Uh, and I'm sure I would be a great minister if I decided to do that. Um, but I am I'm very happy where I am right now. And if I... If there is a God who intentionally put this drive and calling in me to be a magician and an entertainer, content creator, entrepreneur, I guess, um, then it's my job to take care of that gift as well as I can. I did feel a calling to be part of the church. I now feel a calling to be a magician. So if God is, you know, pushing me in the direction that he wants me to go, then it's, you know, my job to continue on that path, no matter if he exists or not. It's, you know, it's my life. I decide what I want to do. But if God wants me to be in a different position, I'm sure he would nudge me in that way. Right. Um, and, and remind me maybe later on uh, to not be a stubborn teenager and fighting this. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's how I feel sometimes when it comes to religion. Like, um, like God is always there with a big hug and whatever. And right. uh, the teenager is like, no, I don't want to. Um, right. Yeah, so it's kind of kind of like that it's for me. It's I'm sure I'll be welcome back if I decide to 
continue studying. Actually, during the pandemic, I did continue my theology studies, which I never really talked about anywhere. Yeah. Um, but but I um, I printed out everything that I had missed for the season, and it was like 20 minutes of printing things out. And during those 20 minutes, I realized how much I missed about the the Greek. So I was like, no, <laughs> I'm going to stick to card tricks. <laughs> yeah. So I printed so many pages, ruined the environment, just to remember. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, yeah. it, it's funny that you bring that up because like when I started doing this podcast, I, before I started interviewing people, I was just talking by myself and I would often say this thing where I'd say God did not design religion, man designed religion. Just that statement. You have any thoughts about that? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, it's great. Yeah. It's great. Well, I have this other thing that I, I think about sometimes that uh, um, it, Jesus was very controversial and people uh, at the time, they didn't really understand what and who he was. Um, like until much later, of course, when they realized and the Bible was created, you know, all of that stuff. Um, but I kind of feel the same thing now. Like imagine if Jesus came back and told us that this is not how you make a church. This is not how you are a community. This is not how you're supposed to preach. This is whatever it is. I am not sure that right. there is any church in the world 2024 that would allow him in and to be the leader. And that kind of scares me about religion. Like if, if he is it and he's not welcome, then wow. Wow. That's amazing. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you're going to get stoned with me. I'm gonna get <laughs> over here doing magic. They're going to try to burn us at the stake. All right. So I'm going to oh, kind of stoned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all right, I got some hot seat questions for you before you head out. All right. I'm ready. So you can answer these as fast as you'd like. So wow. first one is this. Who are your greatest inspirations? Beyonce. <laughs> Stop playing. You being serious. I am being serious. Uh, you, uh, you said that sarcastically, or maybe that's just. No, it's uh, Beyonce 100% and then Copperfield. Uh, okay. Beyonce came from nothing like truly nothing. And she is now, she's the biggest, isn't she? Possibly Taylor Swift, um, but the biggest right now. And she has been for a long time and she takes no, no shit from anybody. Like, you know, right. she, um, fantastic. And I believe she's a twin mom, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, she's, uh, I don't, I don't even talk about her enough, but she, she has this whole thing where she's Queen B, and I always say that I'm Queen C. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but it's, uh, if there's one person dead or alive that I could hang out with, I would choose Beyonce. Amazing. Wait. I don't really listen to her music, though. Yeah. A, you like the story? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Do you have somebody who has passed on? I mean, you I know, know your like father and stuff. Um, oi. Like Maybe a Harry Vernon. Houdini. No, like Vernon. Vernon. He was, he was a, a very rude man. <laughs> and I would like to ask him a few things about, you know, uh, magic is not confusion. Because isn't it? He said that magic is not confusion. But it's, I feel like so many times magic is very confusing. For oh yeah, and for lay people. <laughs> so can we have a conversation about this? Like he he left the page, the rest of that page blank. Like he he needs to give us more. Ma magic is not confusion. Yeah, and he, he wrote that in a book. Maybe he just said it to someone. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, it's kind of kind of awesome. weird thing to say. But I would like to have. A proper sit down with him because I mean he is he's considered the professor. So if somebody's listening to this who's not a magician, um, he's considered the professor, and he was teaching a lot of magicians about you know sleight of hand and theory and methods and stuff like that. And um, it would be really interesting to sit down and understand why for him it was so important to be technical, whereas for me it's more interesting to be a good performer. 
Like I don't right. care about technique. If I can use a gimmick, I will. Uh, right. Yeah. Amazing. So that'd be Another one. Yeah, yeah. I I kind of already asked you this one. I was going to ask you, what do you desire most in life? Mm. What do I desire most in life? To be happy, I guess. Um, I am very happy right now. I live a very fulfilling life. I am sitting in this beautiful studio, um, very close to my home. I can walk home. It takes seven minutes. I can pick up the kids and the, and the way home. I literally have the, the kid care thing. Like the kindergarten is very close to here. Um, I'm very happy that my kids are healthy and, uh, yeah, I have a very nice, um, like what is that? Like, um, my relationship with my siblings are very close right now. We're super close. Um, this whole thing with my dad passing really brought us all together. And I just spent a weekend with my brother and, uh, it was very nice to see that he's so happy too. So that's what I want for all of us, I guess. And, and right. especially for myself to continue this journey of happiness and not, of course I'm sad, you know, it's very sad to lose a yeah. parent. Um, but I'm very happy and proud of, of the life that I created because it was not easy. Like it's, yeah. I've, I've been doing this full time for 10 years. There's been a lot of ups and downs right now. The market is very shaky. A lot of people who have taken on my magic course have all said the same thing. Like it's, um, it's scary how the market is kind of switching now, but I think this is due to the pandemic, the afterworks of the pandemic. There's also a big war in Europe. And there is the uh, inflation thing. And in America, you have the elections. So there are a lot of things going on in the world that we cannot control. Yeah. And you ask, do you want to see a card trick? Uh, <laughs> this is probably not the right time for that kind of conversation. Instead, we should lead with the value and we should lead with building relationships with people that can further down the line be a like a flourishing business relationship or whatever it is. Right. Uh, but what I want, I would like to continue to be happy with what I do and not second guessing what I decided to do. Because um, sometimes that happens, I guess. You know, sometimes you can be like, ah, do you really want to do magic for a living? Uh, but then you're like, oh, yeah, I do want to do magic for a living. That's really yeah. cool. Amazing. All right. Maybe I want to write another book. I think maybe you're about your life story or something. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> what would you write a book about? I'm not sure. I think I want to do the exact same one that I just did, the business side of show business, but make it a longer, more extended one just for public speakers and adding a, a longer TEDx manual kind of to it. Like right. Exactly who to find, where to pitch, how to pitch, how to build a speech, um, like from the perspective of um, like the entertainer telling a public speaker on how to take on the stage. Right. Well, I'll be the first to buy because you got a lot of good nuggets. So, Thank you. okay, if you could change one thing in the world, what would it be? Oh, the war in Ukraine. It's a terrible thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's affecting a lot of people. Right. So many kids. It's a mess over there. It so really is. what are the hardest difficulties you had to overcome? Or just one? Ooh. Oh, my God. Wow. However many you got. Only one. Yeah. Go ahead, go <laughs> Let for me it. just call my think? therapist real quick. She has the <laughs> list. Uh, she has the billing list. Uh, <laughs> hard to think. It, ah, I was very shy when I was a kid. I, um, Same. I, for my high school speech thing, we have this like after high school, well, leading up to the graduation, we were all supposed to write a speech. And most people wrote a speech like a, Thank you for coming to my graduation party speech. Um, but I wrote a speech to myself, thanking myself for uh, for standing up to bullies and for, you know, uh, not bending over, I guess, uh, for the bullying that I had uh, encountered my entire life up until that point. Um, and I think I, th I think maybe that's there's something in that where um where you, you sometimes have to look at yourself in a different perspective and be like, oh, okay, this is who I am in this moment. And right. I guess that's, what was the question again? Oh, what are the hardest difficulties you had to overcome? Mm, okay. So yeah, definitely. So when I was super bullied, I, I didn't ever raise my hand. I never took the opportunity to you know, stand in front of my class or dance during dance hour or whatever it was. 
Uh, and now all of a sudden I'm performing for thousands of people and putting my content out on YouTube um, or whatever. I wrote a book telling people how to do this. Uh, it was really scary, really scary to put it out. And Leonie, the my book? assistant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Leonie was sitting right, literally right here, two meters from here, uh, one and a half meters from here. Uh, and I would read a chapter to her. And afterwards, I would be like, is this valuable? Really? Truly? Do you think people will get value of this? Uh, and she was like, yeah, Carolyn, trust me, it's great. It's going to be amazing. Uh, and she was right. Um, but yeah, so, so far, all the reviews, knock on wood, uh, all of them have been great. <laughs> all of the reviews. Um, and my partner asked me yesterday, like, because I got a new one yesterday. And he was like, did you ever get a bad review? I was like, why would you ask me that? Now I'm going to get a bad one. Because um, I still get this. I think it might be from the bullying in the past. You know, I have this like, imposter syndrome. Um, and, and yeah, that's what I was going to get to with that speech. I sometimes still have to remind myself, like, it's it's okay. Like, things are things are yeah. not as bad as people told me. Like, I will not be shoved into a bathroom door walking through the corridor. Like, all of these, I, I'm, I'm not the only one. A lot of people have been victims of bullying. But I'm sure that everybody has this constant fear of being either seen or not seen or whatever it is and that can haunt us for an entire lifetime no matter how famous you get or how many people you perform for um, but truly i think that was the hardest thing i had to overcome that wow. fear of because it i wasn't i wasn't really fear like i wasn't fearing not being seen i was more fearing being seen like what would they say to me when they saw me like, what can they tell me today? Uh, that my hair is, I have red hair. So they would make fun of my hair. They would make fun of my freckles. They, they made fun of your red hair eyes. though? Oh, when yeah. you were a kid? Yeah, they called me Pippi Longstocking every day. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. But look at me now, I'm super strong. <laughs> right, yeah, I know, making some gains. <laughs> yeah, I actually just went benching before this interview. <laughs> oh, heck yeah. Dang you, yeah, you on it. Wait, what time is it over there? It's now seven o'clock. 7 p.m. Yep. Amazing. All right. Well, my brother had this thing uh, when I was visiting him this weekend. He was like, "Oh, Carolyn, how much can you bench?" And I was like, "I don't know. Psh, I can do the bar a few times." <laughs> and he was like, "How many times?" I was like, Psh, "Maybe, maybe 15 times." And he was like, "No way. 50 bucks. 50 bucks. You go. <laughs> we're gonna go right now." <laughs> and he works in the military, so he was like, "We're on." Yeah. And we went down. Uh, I did. 14 really strong ones and then nice. I made the mistake of like looking him in the eye and he was like <laughs> you know and, <laughs> and I looked him in the eye and I just couldn't stop laughing yeah so I lost 50 dollars he took the I 50 done bucks it, though. yeah I could have done it <laughs> yeah I've been trying to take care of my health especially these past couple of years like working out going doing the gym yeah. all right so well, I gained 88 pounds during my pregnancy so I've I've lost around eighty of them, so it's a, you know, it's still a journey. But I seen I seen you post your pictures of you when you were pregnant and stuff. I'm like, you, you didn't really look that much different. Yeah, <laughs> look the same. I could uh, could hide an elephant behind me. <laughs> you got two sons, right? I do. Yeah. Awesome. That's cool. Secret and Roy. I'm kidding. You think, you think they're gonna? <laughs> you think they're gonna be magicians? I hope they're not gonna turn out to be jugglers. Up. <laughs> mm. Oh my no, no god. Oh, uh, you know what? I just want them to I want them to have something creative if they want yes. to be painters or singers or magicians, um whatever it is that they want. I want them to have a, a creative outlet. So it's very important to me that that's um that that's nourished and not just um uh, here is your school stuff that you have to do. This is the entrepreneur stuff or whatever it is. Um, the, I always try to, like, actually I was baking with them the other day. They're, they're two and a half years old. I have no idea what they're doing. Um, but it's important to me to be that parent to that make sure that we are. amazing. Yeah. That we're taking care of that creativity that kids have naturally, instead of just yeah. being, here's a, an iPad for you to study better. I would like to be the one to say, let's make clay today. Yes. Mm -mm -mm. Going to have some high <laughs> IQ children. Yeah, that's, that's a into, that's a good unique situation for them being too. Like a mother who performs and you're a businesswoman and all that. That's awesome. Yeah. What should we expect? I got two, three, three more questions. This is one of them. What should we expect from Caroline Raven in the future? 
greatness. No, <laughs> yes. <laughs> benching more than the bar. Um, <laughs> 15 reps. Uh, 16. I'm going to push it. <laughs> Um, what can we expect? Well, more books for sure. I'm going to be doing a lot of, a lot more lectures for magicians. Cause now I feel like I have something to say. Um, when I started watching lectures, it was only trick, 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 trick. And then here by my gimmick. Um, but I feel like that's never been me. I don't create magic. I, I produce amazing shows instead. <laughs> that's what I'm um, talking about. Yeah. So it's, I want to start lecturing more for magicians. Um, and, and teaching them the business side of show business because nobody else is. Yeah, it's it really is rare, it, mm. you know. So, and then when I do find someone talking about business with magic, it's usually some outdated advice, you know. So, mm. do you ever tell people your magical secrets? Oh, like teach them the tricks? I do. Yeah. Um, I perform during like the, the cruise ships I do. I always bring in a camera, so we do close-up tricks. Um, and I show them a jumping rubber band trick. And I always say, if you see me around the ship, please come up to me. I will be happy to teach this to you. Uh, and so I teach them the jumping rubber band tricks. And sometimes I even That's teach cool. them how to vanish a coin or, you know, the pen behind the ear trick or right. something simple like that. Yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Give people a little, little nuggets because... You know, it's like if you want to be a real deal magician like Raven, mm -hmm. she ain't going to teach you all the secrets, but we'll give you a little rubber band, <laughs> give you a little pen. <laughs> but it, it is where it starts. It is. Know? That's it's where it started with me. It's misdirection and, you know, all of that stuff. So, right. And I also think that if somebody knows a little bit of magic and understands how hard sleight of hand can be, they're going to experience such more joy watching the show. Like if right. you know the piano and then you go watch a fantastic piano player you're going to be like whoa do you have any idea how hard that was um is they have this different appreciation i guess yeah can you recall the first magic trick you ever did uh, on a stage on a stage i can remember the one the first one I okay. did on stage yeah okay uh, it was uh let me think probably mm, probably march 2014 um i made a ukulele appear uh, and it was terrible. A ukulele. And, yeah. And I <laughs> I, uh, I asked a few other guys, uh, other magicians, if they could uh, teach me how to make a ukulele appear. And they said, th this one guy said, uh, trial and error. And I went on all the magic shops. I searched for trial and error because that's what I thought that the trick was called. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm blonde, really. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. Oh my God, I should tell him. I should tell him that I did. <laughs> That's so funny. I think the first one I can recall either making the coin disappear or putting the, on the, the, the glass and make the coin go through the glass. Oh, did that yeah, on my nice. brothers. They love that. All right, my last yeah. question. Biggest one of them all. Did you have fun? Oh my God, I had a lot of fun. This was great. You know, sitting and talking about yourself is one thing, but at being asked questions about not only why do you do magic, but also the deeper stuff. That's, that's really nice. So thank you. Amazing. And anytime you, you want to do fun? another one, I'm always here. Absolutely. And you know what? Good. As a matter of fact, I think, I think I had a change of heart. I think I had a change of heart. Of heart. Yeah. You don't do witchcraft. Oh, You're just really good at what you do. Yeah, I try. <laughs> I try. And you have a lot of confidence. You said that you used to be shy when you grew up. I can see the confidence. Like when I watch your stuff, a lot of confidence. I love your professionalism. Going through your book, I'm almost finished with it. There's a lot of good principles in there. And I highly recommend anybody, doesn't matter if you're just in magic, but if you're just someone who wants to perform on a stage period and you want to know business the business side of things you got to get this book i'm not even i'm about three-fourths through and i've already got a lot out of it and i'm a picky person like yeah like, it, if i didn't like the book i probably wouldn't say anything i just <laughs> i'll just talk about the book or whatever you know yeah. but I'm, I'm a picky person so if i say i like it i'm telling you the truth it's really good that's very kind of you so I feel like All I have right. to show you something. I got a new tattoo, actually, a couple of weeks ago. Was it on your wrist? It is. Yeah, I just saw really... you lift your hand up. Let me see. Yes, it's here. It's uh, I have to. I can't do it like this. But here it is. This is a um, 
it's a paper airplane and the shadow is a jumbo jet. What does that mean? uh, It means that sometimes I am a paper plane. I'm very fragile. I'm very shy and I can be swooped by the wind in just a second and I'm crumbled up. And then when you open me up again, it's I'm going to be filled with wrinkles. But as soon as I stand (laughs) on a stage, I'm going to be a jumbo jet no matter what. I can see that. Amazing. So, hey, look, I love it. Do you have any last words or anything before you you go? Oh, any any, last any advice to female entrepreneurs? I have a female entrepreneur friend who I showed her oh, some of your stuff too. That's um, fantastic. Yeah. Um, say yes to everything, and, and you can always change your mind later. Um, always start with value. Don't ask for people to give you things. Instead, be the provider for people. So when you reach out to people, instead of saying hi. I do magic for a living. Do you want to hire me to your next party? Instead, lead with value. Say, amazing. I'm so excited. I love your brand. I love your company. I work as a professional entertainer and I've followed you guys for a long time. Is there any possibility you are planning any event? I would love to see if there is a match for you and I to work together. Please let me know. Uh, So instead of giving them just a push, 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 try to be the one to build relationships and to make sure that you are constantly leading with value. That's going to change your entire life, not only your professional life, but also your personal life. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Caroline Raven, for being on the show. Thank you. Hope you all subscribe to the Cree podcast. Check out Caroline Raven. And um, I'm glad that I did this interview with you because I was like, I didn't know how how it was going to go. I was like, oh, man. (laughs) <laughs> did, 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 did they cancel on me? Because they just maybe they came across one of my videos and they thought I was weird or something. And then they just were like, nah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but then when you got, you said, hey, no, no. What would your friend say, Leone? She was like, oh, we remember you. Oh, we're yeah. Do with you. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I actually reached out to her. I was like, can you please push this? Um, and that was just a couple of months ago, I believe. Uh, yes. <laughs> we, we were planning on doing this interview when my dad was in hospice, I believe. So that's why we had to cancel. Yeah, yeah, no, nah, it makes sense. Yeah. So, anyways, but I'm happy we got around to it. If anytime you want to do any another one or need help with anything, I hear I got gotcha. you, magician Thanks. homies. All right, God Forever bless. Forever and ever. <laughs>